Welcome everyone to today's inside look uh, titled How Fresh Direct's brand story has ripened over the past 20 years. It is their 20th anniversary this year, if you can believe that. So we are very excited to have some creative folks from their team join us today. I'm gonna switch over to their presentation. Oh, and we're at the back, so give a little tease as we get back to the top. <laughs> All right, let's bring them on. Katie and John, nice to see you. Welcome, welcome. I'm gonna let you introduce yourselves and we'll and we'll get started. Hi everyone, thanks Jeremy. Um, I'm Katie Zapata. I head up the brand team here. Um, I've been with Restaurant eight years uh, and had a few different roles, but in my current role, um, we basically run a mini agency inside the company. We cover design, photography, video, copy, PR, and then the overall marketing planning. So we're a small and mighty team um, that has a lot of fun together. Uh, before Fresh Direct, I worked in media marketing um, in magazines, if you remember what those are. <laughs> and um, I worked for a cable company for a minute and then um, a website uh, for a few years before coming here. I studied at the University of Pennsylvania. I majored in communications and Latin American studies. And I had really a lot of fun studying abroad. I studied in Chile and in Spain. And I even took a history of advertising class while I was in Spain. So it's been my passion for a long time. Um, and we uh, we added our own favorite products. Of course, I have to call out some Fresh Direct uh, favorites. I love our Jumbo Blueberries. I go through two boxes myself every week. I highly recommend them if you're in our market. That's so fun. I love that you guys added that. Um, when you say Jumbo, how big, how Jumbo are they? They could be the size of a quarter. They're pretty big. That's awesome. Yeah, they're not always the size of a quarter, but they're, they get pretty big in season. Great, love that. And John? Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Kelly III. I'm the senior managing photographer here at Fresh Direct. Uh, I studied film and television production at New York University, which is, I guess, as I found out a few minutes ago, one of your clients also. Um, I worked in film and television production for about five years prior to joining Fresh Direct. Uh, I've been with the Fresh Direct Photo Studio for going on 10 years it'll be about 10 years i think this september or october and i started in my first role as a temporary digital asset manager uh, in my current role i manage all of the in-house captured visual media so that would include product and lifestyle photography as well as video and i manage all vendor supplied product imagery uh, for the site Currently, uh, my favorite Fresh Direct product is the De La Calle Tapache, which is a delicious, refreshing Mexican pineapple-based fermented beverage. And my favorite flavor is the Picante Mango Chili. Awesome. When you say fermented beverage, is that similar to a kombucha then? It is, yeah. It's like a, you know, and it has probiotic properties and all that jazz. I mean, it, you know, it tastes like a delicious, refreshing soda without all the sugar, but it's, yeah, it's... Okay. It's my new fixation and obsession, and I just can't get enough. I'm into it. I'm into it. Well, I'm excited to hear from you and learn from you today. So let's jump in. Awesome. Um, so for anybody who's not based in New York, we thought we'd give a quick intro to our company and what we do. Um, we are like and not like every other grocery store, um, which I'll explain, but we are really an online grocery shopping pioneer. 20 years ago, think about what was available in 2002. This just didn't even exist. So Fresh Prep has been at the forefront of grocery innovation really this, the past 20 years, and we continue to innovate every day. Um, I'd say our secret sauce, what makes us really stand apart and gives us the staying power, a lot of these companies have come and gone and we're still here. Um, our secret sauce is our devotion and our utter obsession with the food. Um, that has not changed in the 20 years. Everything we do for the food, our system is built for the food. We work directly with farmers, fishermen, suppliers to find the absolute best quality taste out there. And then when we bring it to our facility, it is kept in its optimal state. We have 38 temperature zones because bananas need a different temperature than tomatoes and onions. We have different rooms for each of those. Um, and we never break the cold chain. If something needs to be refrigerated, it is kept cold until just about the minute it reaches your door. 
So you get the food at its optimal state, it stays fresher in your, in your home, and it tastes great when you eat it. So we're like a grocery store, but not like a grocery store because of that. Um, and then the other thing is we stay as closely connected as possible to our customer to make sure we are giving them exactly what they need in terms of the food, but also the convenience. So we've, we've innovated over the years in, in terms of how we deliver, when, where, what we deliver. Um, so we've added meal kits and other things to make your life easier. So between the quality of the food and our connection to the customer, we, we really stand apart. Okay, so now we'll wind the clock back just a little bit and uh, and take a look at where we started as an organization. So what you're looking at right now is a screenshot of the original site at launch um, and some of our original out-of-home marketing. And what I'll say, uh, especially in the early days, is I think um, you know we were very much trying to translate the experience of the grocery store, um, where many of our founding members originated in that industry to the experience of e-commerce or online shopping, which itself, you know, you have to think back 20 years ago, 2002, um, e-commerce was still in and of itself very new. So I think at the time we were very much focused on the fundamentals of kind of how to deliver on the basic premise. You know, how are we gonna get groceries to customers through the internet? Um, and we really weren't yet at that point uh, considering our brand identity or really how best to communicate who we were to the customer. I just gotta so, say, yeah. before the slide, I just gotta say, I love this old web page. It's such a throwback. <laughs> I have to also, also, also note that the browser in which it's being viewed is Netscape, which, you know, if you can remember that, clearly not current. <laughs> <laughs> right, on the next. So uh, here's some examples of uh, some of our branding from the time. So uh, one example you see there is, kind of an owned out of home space that was above our old facility in Long Island City, um, as well as our original delivery trucks and the boxes which we used for delivery um, for you know a, much of the initial period of uh, our existence. And I think a lot of the branding at the time, again, uh, it was very focused on simplicity. You know, we're really trying to grab people's attention. So you'll notice, in a lot of uh, what you see here is that the logo is very prominent and the web address is very prominent. Um, there's a lot of bold, punchy text uh, and language emphasized. And really what we were trying to do is, again, grab people's attention, uh, kind of get the brand name out there and in people's minds, but you know, really we're not yet at the point of kind of refining what, what our brand meant and what it was going to mean to people. Um, and an interesting you know, point of irony, which will draw me into talking about you know, more of our current state is that you see, especially on this billboard, um, in big bold letters, it declares it's all about the food, um, but you can't see any food. There's no food anywhere. Um, and you know, what we found as an organization is that over time, because of the limitations of being on the web versus having a physical location, you know, we have very limited sensory touch points. Um, with which the customers can interact to the products that we're selling. So the big challenge for us is how to convey the quality of our food um, almost purely visually. So as we've you know kind of matured and refined our strategy over time, we've worked a lot harder to let the food speak for itself, uh, kind of to let the food do the work of creating a visceral connection to the brand. So here we are now, uh, where I actually am physically now. I don't know if you can actually see where my studio would be on that side of the building, but that's where I am. Um, we're at uh, we're at our new facility in the Bronx. It's a purpose-built facility. Um, it's about three times the scale of our original location. And really this space was designed uh, for the future and designed to meet our growth ambitions. And as we look at a little bit more current um, you know, some of our, our more current designs, uh, you see some out of home marketing here on the subway, you see our uh, bag designs and our truck designs. We really have leaned much more heavily into beautiful photography, um, which features fresh food and really bold colors. And once again, we've really tried much harder to kind of let the food speak for itself and to let the food entice the audience and, and 
draw their interest into us as a brand. So I'll bring you through a little bit of the timeline of Fresh Direct as a brand. So again, rolling back the clock to 2002, uh, that was our first customer order. Uh, in 2003, we started our in-house kitchen, which was intended to provide fresh, delicious, and convenient prepared foods for our customers. Uh, and a lot of what comes out of our in-house kitchen, uh, a lot of those products continue to consistently be favorites of our most loyal customers. In 2005, we developed Fresh Direct at the office which gave an opportunity for office managers to stock their corporate pantries and cater their events with the highest quality food and beverages that we have available. Uh, in 2016, um, we, or at least prior to 2016, we only really had one delivery speed available to our customers and that was next day delivery. Uh, but what we wanted to do in 2016 was provide the most convenient service available where we could deliver to our customers within hours. Um, and typically we're talking about, you know, within an hour or two of customer orders being placed. Um, and express delivery continues to be uh, a prominent feature of our service uh, offering. In 2020, uh, as a result of the pandemic, we were able to use our food and distribution resources um, to help New Yorkers who were greatly in need at the time through partnerships with New York City's Five Borough Food Drive Initiative, as well as partnering with the New York Common Pantry. Um, and again, you know, being able to use our resources and kind of you know, provide for people who very much needed help at the time um, was something that we were really proud of being able to uh, accomplish during that period. And then most recently in 2021, uh, we were acquired by Ajo Deles, which is a global conglomeration of grocery brands um, from across the globe which allowed us to kind of join a community of brands um, from all over the world and has given us uh, the opportunity to be supported and have the resources to continue to innovate and grow as a brand. Awesome. So we thought it'd be fun to take you through um, some past campaigns and show how we've evolved a bit. Um, like I said, I've been here eight years and jumped in here 10 years. So we didn't go back to the beginning of time, but um, this was one of the first campaigns um, I was involved in when I started. Uh, we got a fast opportunity to uh, get on the subway. So we did. Subways have been uh, a big deal for us because uh, it's hard to grab New Yorkers, right? We're busy. Not everybody's watching the same thing on TV or, or whatever. So subway is universal. We're all taking it. Uh, so it's a great way to grab people. So this campaign, um, said it was a fast turnaround we didn't have time to shoot in photography but our theme of this campaign was was pretty you know whimsical and so the design really laddered up to that you can see it's very of the time we're talking about kale and being hangry and there's hashtags all over but um we really humor has been part of our dna since day one uh, if we showed you more of the original advertising from the beginning there were a lot of food puns and um a lot of humor there and we really held on to that which you'll see um, in our evolution but this one really brought the humor forward and with relatable situations that everybody every new yorker faces right so our, the next campaign and this is not this is not an exhaustive list <laughs> we actually have a lot more advertising but and picked a few um emblematic campaigns so this was our go forth and conquer campaign from 2016 and you can see we made a huge shift a huge investment in photography really elevating the photography to pull you in and engage um, the customers. Again, you know, you're on the subway or you're getting a mailer, like this photography really pulls you in. So we're excited to, to lean into that. And really, like John said, let the, the food shine through. Our food is delicious. We want the photography to convey that. Um, so the, it was around this time that we made that switch and you'll see uh, throughout our, our campaigns how we really lean into that. So this is one of my favorites, um, early 2020, before the pandemic. Um, you know, January is a big time of year for us uh, as people shift their habits, get back on track. And, um, you know, it's winter. Nobody wants to go to the grocery store. It's really big, a big, good time for us. So um, we run on the subways then and, we, you know, other advertising. It was really nice to have this beautiful, warm, colorful uh, campaign out when it's the doldrums of winter, when it's gray and dark every day. It was really fun to have a, a nice, bright campaign 
that again really let the food shine through you can see this is actually the same soup picture that was on the campaign before but we've totally pivoted and make made the food pop even more by using this bright color um but again with humorous lines that that are part of our dna i love the creative double dipping of creative uh visuals awesome. yeah they're good the good photos like we will keep using them we have lots of use for them um, so this year, like you mentioned, on our 20th anniversary, uh, we celebrated July 11th was our actual, no, sorry, I have the date wrong, July 13th was our actual anniversary. Um, and, you know, of course, we chose the Big Apple as our symbol for our anniversary that we carried throughout all of our creative. But we had, it was so nice to celebrate our birthday by giving back to our customers, to our employees, to our community. Um, we had some really fun activations. We did a sweepstakes to win a, year, a year's worth of groceries, which was really cool. We held 20 days of giveaways, both for our customers and our employees, so they could try lots of great products. Um, that was a big hit. And then we did some fun, this 20 years of fresh, that was an email that we sent out using the data that we have, right, of, of all of our customers over 20 years. You can see we've sold 33 million bananas over the years. Um, it's it's really it's really fun to be able to look back at those stats and see the scale of what we do um and then we had some really cool partnerships if you want to go to the next slide i can um talk through some of those um, so we worked with the new york times and their t brand content studio to highlight some of our long-term customers and how fresh direct fits into their lives so um these were basically advertorial units that ran uh, across their platform and then we also did a spot on the daily podcast so it was really cool to hear our name on the podcast we worked with allison roman who already was a fresh direct fan um if you follow her she's a food influencer chef um she has her own series now called home movies with allison roman on youtube and so we partnered to help support the series and she did three different recipes for us but she was already talking about Fresh Direct. We already knew she was a fan. We actually, you know, little secret, we supply a lot of the food publishers in New York City. You know, if they're cooking, when we've been to the, some of their test kitchens, it's really fun to check out their prop room and everything, see how they shoot. But, um, you know, if you want grocery in Midtown, it's not easy to come by. Fresh Direct is a great supplier for them and it has the quality they need. So um, that was the same was true with Allison Roman. She already was ordering from us um, for a lot of her work. Um, so it was really cool to be able to support what she does. And um, I did not put that, I love you too, Allison, on there. That was from her video. <laughs> she loves us and we love her too. That's awesome. Um, and we also supported another Bronx um, hometown brand, the New York Yankees. They hold a game every year called Old Timers Day where they have some of the old players come back. And so it was really fun to, to sponsor this game was end of July. And we also had a lucky row where the winners in that row got a Fresh Direct gift card. We got to be on the field. It was a really, really fun day for us. Oh, workflow week. Okay. I, I realized I should have had some more segue slides in here, but um, we, I am a workflow nerd. So I was excited when you asked us to do <laughs> some workflow slides as painful as it was to write this down. <laughs> this is how we used to do it. I call it our spaghetti mess. It's not even showing you how messy it really was in actuality, but I mean, the good and the bad of this is Fresh Direct, you know, we're 20 years old, but in a lot of ways we still um, have the spirit of a startup uh, where it's all hands on deck, do what you need to do to get it done. And like everyone pitches in, I really love that part of our culture. However, sometimes that means just start a new process and don't really think about the long-term implication of that process or start it because we need it right this minute and then 10 years later we're still using the same process so i think that's what you see happening here um basically every team every channel developed their own process and they all were independent of each other different tools they didn't speak to each other there was you know lack of transparency uh you know if a plan changed you had to go cast communicate it 10 different places to tell everybody Food is dynamic, like things change all the time for us. The pumpkin patch floods, the lobsters, the water's too cold and lobsters don't shed their shells. Like these things have happened here. You know, the merchant, you know, we change a discount from 10 to 15%. Well, you gotta go back and tell 50 other people that those plans change. 
and it was really hard to do with the process that we had on, on all these different tools from Outlook calendars to Excel. The merch homepage planning was done in Excel with the crazy pivot tables. And then uh, the social media team was using Google Sheets. PR was like lots of mini conversations that were not even documented. It was madness. Um, so I'm really excited. It gives me a lot of peace to show our current process, which is much more organized. Um, like I said, I'm a workflow nerd, so I'm really proud of, of what we built here. Um, now, really, we lean on a tool called Airtable for this. Photoshop is a part of it, which John will show you, but um, Airtable helps us keep everything together. I'm a, a big cheerleader for them. What we what it allows us to do is to plan, like instead of making a plan in a PowerPoint or an Excel that lives on SharePoint and then having to go execute like we did before in Basecamp or Podio or another Excel sheet or email, the worst, <laughs> here we plan and execute in Airtable. So it has really cut out a lot of the, the back and forth that we used to have. It also allows us, each channel has its own little world. You know, photo team has a tab and John organizes it the way he needs. The email team works off a calendar. The homepage planning is done in a grid. Everybody can design it how they want, but they all speak to each other where they need to speak to each other. So where a homepage initiative will end up in an email, if that discount changes, that information is cascaded down to the email team automatically. Nobody has to go remember to tell 50 people, it just happens. So that has really streamlined a lot of our workflow. So to talk through the way we do it, we start with marketing or commercial planning. Uh, we write briefs for the season or for big holidays, for our big uh, tiered campaigns. We meet once a week to talk through whatever's coming up and then all, the, all of that gets pushed into Airtable. The merchants meet once a month to talk about um, their homepage planning and they use the information from our commercial planning process to um, inform what they're doing. But they make their plans, they, the merchants pitch in Airtable, we all meet as a group and the, like say 20 things got pitched, 10 of them get selected to move forward. Um, again, that happens in Airtable. Where design or photo or copy are needed, that happens again through Airtable and then all that gets uh, put into the CMS and live on the site. In parallel, we meet about a week and a half after the homepage planning meeting. All of the channel owners meet together to talk through our plans for that same month. So right now we are about to plan um, October. So we're, we're about six weeks out. We might get a little further out, but again, food is dynamic, so we can't get six months out, right? That would be really hard for us. So right now we're about six weeks out we get together and we talk through what we heard in the in the merchants meeting and the merchants by the way i forget this is not a word that everybody knows the merchants are the team that buy the food that work with the vendors um you know we have a seafood merchant who's talking to the fishermen and and knows what's going on and they they plan the promotions that go on the site like august we want to put swordfish on sale that, that type of thing so anyway, we hear what the merchants want to do, then all the channel owners get together and we talk about how we can support what the merchants have told us, what holidays are coming up, what other company initiatives we need to support, and we coordinate our efforts. Everybody has their own calendar, but we talk about, like someone says, the homepage team says, I would, John, I'd really love to get a new Apple photo because we haven't done one in a while. We've been using that same photo for a while. Can we, can we shoot apples for this month? And then the email team says, oh, that'd be great, but can we get a gift because I want to test static versus GIF in, in, in the email campaign. And then social says, oh, I want to do a recipe. Can we get a recipe in that same shoot? And this is a chance for us to talk to each other and coordinate our plans. So that's the purpose of that meeting, really. And from there, everybody goes off, again, uses Airtable to help execute what they're doing and then translate it into whatever tool they use. So for email, we use Celligent. We use WordPress for our blog. Um, Agora Pulse for social media, and then PR, we have an agency, so it's mostly email and meetings and, you know, business wire if we have to put out a press release. So that's that's, our, that's how we do it today. Love it. Love it. And it's so fun that you put this together, and and, and I love that you showed the, the previous uh, spaghetti mess or whatever you called it as well. So thank you for that. Oh, we're gonna get John on. I got it. I got it. So yeah, I'm. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna go a little bit more in detail specifically about the photo workflow because I know that you know um, 
probably at least a certain portion of everybody listening today um, is in that area specifically. Um, so essentially, you know, all of the requests originate from a variety of sources. Uh, some of those are more formal sources and some of those are more informal sources. So um, kind of laddering into the process that Katie was talking about, uh, some of those more formal sources would be uh, Airtable requests, for example, which again, would go through that process and then um, somewhere along the line, you know, um, I would be notified or tagged in that request, and then it would kind of come into my wheelhouse, and then it would become my responsibility to, to you know, log that and start to execute on that request. Um, additionally, I'll get requests. Um, my requests for product photography primarily come through email. Um, we have email chains uh, for all of our what we call either SKU creation requests or um, changes to existing SKUs, but basically all of that um, is email-based. And then uh, we have some of the more informal requests, which I would consider kind of, you know, like verbal drive-bys, um, or uh, as you see the, the photo of some tomatoes there, um, I'm calling it like a handful of food where somebody basically just walks in with like a bag of something and they're like, hey, you know, can you shoot these? Um, but you know that that tends to be the less um, less predominant method by which by which I get those requests. But regardless regardless of how it comes in, whether it comes in through a formal process or an informal process, everything somehow um, is going to get condensed and documented in Airtable for me. Um, so I have my own photography specific workspace where I'll capture um, all the client needs uh, for both editorial and photo shoot requests. And then I'll um, I'll schedule those shoots accordingly. Um, once the shoots are scheduled, um, you know, especially for editorial photography, if you know the order of all the requested items has been placed, uh, or for product photography, if samples have been have been provided, um, then we shoot. So on actual shoot day, um, right now I'm shooting with a Canon 5D SR tethered to a MacBook Pro. And capture is performed within the Capture One Pro software. Um, so no no shooting to card, everything goes straight to the laptop. Um, once everything is shot, uh, you know, everyone is satisfied with the results, uh, then we go into post-production. And once we get to post-production, that's where the process kind of splits a little bit, um, depending upon the type of photography we're doing. So for product photography, um, I basically don't do editing, uh, any editing in Capture One. I basically just output that to TIFFs, uh, full res TIFFs, which will then go into Photoshop for um, Silo or Silhouette um, and basic uh, cosmetic retouching. And then once those images are complete, they're run through Photoshop droplets, uh, which were designed um, by me and previous photographers. And basically the intent of those is to scale all those images for the various sizes that are required by our site template. Once the product images uh, are then loaded by our site store team, the original requesting clients uh, for each of those items are notified by email and sent preview links uh, so that they can look at a preview version of the product page and just verify you know, that the photos um, a ended up in the right place, and B, you know, uh, look the way that they want them to. For editorial photography, we'll go back uh, slightly after the production process. Um, for the most part, those don't require a lot of retouching. So, in that case, I'll basically do some basic levels and dynamic range adjustments in Capture One, and then output those to full res TIFFs. I'll then upload those TIFFs to a photo shelter gallery that um, usually has a name that can be cross-referenced with the original um, request that was in Airtable or whatever source it came from. Um, and then I'll add metadata tags, qualitative metadata, quali qualitative metadata tags uh, to those images in photo shelter so that they can be searched after the fact. Uh, I'll then add a link to the photo shelter gallery to the corresponding Airtable request record. And then using an automation within Airtable, uh, it will then notify all of the requesters or original project collaborators that the images are now available uh, for view and download in photo shelter. Additionally, on top of that, uh, in addition to that, I like to use an internal Teams uh, photo studio channel 
to share out a link to the photo shelter gallery and provide some sample JPEGs of some of those images. And that allows me to kind of notify a broader group within the organization who might not necessarily be directly tied to that job. Um, you know, just make them aware of projects that are happening inside of the photo studio. Very cool. I love the thorough uh, process behind it all. It's really cool to see. I know a lot of people appreciate seeing different like different brands. Like we, we talk to sports teams and, and higher ed institutions all the time about this type of stuff. So to see it from a brand like Fresh Direct is is very cool. On to the next. Yeah. So since we, you know, since we were kind of looking back retrospectively, um, you know, and since I've been gathering data over, you know, at least the last eight years of my time here, I wanted to go over some kind of high level stats and fun facts uh, about photos specifically. So for editorial and lifestyle photography, uh, we've done about a thousand requests. Um, within that, we've shot about 4,000 uh, editorial images, which is what I would consider images that are visually distinct from each other. Um, we've also done close to 200 stop motion animations or GIFs and about 200 videos. Uh, typically, our busiest day for editorial photography is Wednesday, and the busiest month is June. Um, and then for product photography, we've done about uh, close to 9,000 requests. Um, and within that, we've managed about, I guess, close to 41,000 photos. Uh, of those, a little over 5,000 have been shot and retouched in-house, and about 35,000 have been vendor supplied. The busiest day of the week for product image uploads is Friday. Uh, the busiest week of the year for product image uploads is week 14, which is April 5th through 11th. And the biggest categories internally for uh, in-house photography are prepared foods, and for vendor supplied photography, it's grocery. These are fun, like just like such, such nitty gritty uh, details, I love it. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is, though, you know, as you as you kind of compile this information over time, it's interesting to see what's happening because, you know, I don't know, I guess, as the old saying goes, the unexamined life is not worth living. So <laughs> it's nice, nice to see that there's some progress being made over time. But. Yeah, I will say before I go to the next slide, I'm curious. I mean, when it comes to like stop it, stop motion or GIFs. Mm -hmm. um, or videos, uh, perhaps. Like there, it's obviously a lot lower than your other requests or kind of projects there. But are you seeing any increase lately? Because I know that like there are a ton of you know platforms yeah. out there that are just like totally prioritizing video. So I'm curious. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, anecdotally, I will say, um, you know, probably within the last, um, certainly the last three years, maybe the last five years. Um, that's that's gone up exponentially. It's become a much larger proportion of um, of what we're shooting, particularly for editorial photography, just because, as you know, um, as you probably know, a lot of the platforms, you know, social media platforms and things like that are favoring video content. Um, and it's just, you know, especially to before, you know, before we even had, because I remember starting Fresh Direct at a time when we didn't even really have much of a social media pre presence, if any at all. Um, you know, we didn't really have that many outlets for video. Um, there just wasn't a need. Whereas now, you know, it's much more ubiquitous and consider much a much bigger part of the brand mix. So yeah, it, it's definitely gone up in recent years. All right, so as we're looking back retrospectively, um, you know, everybody had to start somewhere. Um, so, as we uh, as we discussed Fresh Direct's journey over the past 20 years, I wanted to share a little bit of our own journey during the same time frame. So 20 years ago, Katie, what were you up to? Uh, I was in my early 20s, living, having fun in New York City, um, and traveling around. This picture's me in Ireland at the time. Um, but I was already working in marketing. Uh, I was moving from Golf Digest, where I would interned and started my career, to Oxygen Media. And I was just soaking up everything. There was so much to learn. And for me, the transition from magazines to cable, like, was, I was, I was really just so interested in what was different from one medium to another. And um, I think that curiosity is something that's carried through for me um, throughout my career. So some things stay the same. <laughs> yeah. So 20 years ago, I was a junior in high school. Um, 
I was trying to, and again, just to just to kind of show you how my focus has changed over time. I was I was trying to make the varsity boat on the crew team, uh, and I was applying to colleges and very much stressing over entrance exams. And at the time, I was considering a career in web design. Um, and concurrently, at the same time, Fresh Direct was delivering a handful of grocery orders to uh, some intrepid Manhattanites. And at the time, they were really betting on the hunch that one day people would really want or need to buy their food online. Um, and you know, to that end, speaking about us, speaking about Fresh Direct, I think everything really starts with some kind of a dream or like a big idea. Um, and I think as companies and as individuals, as we pursue those dreams or ideas, uh, we have a tendency to grow and evolve. Inevitably, you, we're gonna make choices and sacrifices along the way that will lead us down different paths. Um, where we find ourselves eventually may not look exactly the way we had pictured it in the beginning, but hopefully over time, you know, our current and future states will end up affirming the things that we believed since the very beginning. And I think, um, you know, certainly Fresh Direct and uh, each of us uh, feel that way about our trajectory. So hopefully everyone else does too. I love that. Thank you guys. That was very special to get a little inside look at what you guys have been up to for a while and how the brand has changed a bit. I'm going to switch back to our deck here. Um, and we can, uh, before we take some questions, we do have a little list of questions building up. Um, before, I want to give everyone an opportunity. If, you, if you're interested in learning more about Photo Shelter for brands, um, now's your chance to kind of use this cool Q, uh, QR code to. Uh, jump in and learn more, you can connect with our team. I did want to give an opportunity for people to uh, kind of get in there and, and connect with us. So if you want to unlock your brand's storytelling potential and learn more about our product, now is your chance to uh, pull out your phone, take a picture of this QR code that will bring you to the right destination. Um, I do have some questions here, um, and I want to get into that before we wrap up. We have some uh, time for Q&A. Um, one question I wanted to get into uh, was related to uh, some of like the subway, the cool subway uh, campaigns that you guys had. So um, I'm pulling up some of these questions here. How do you um, measure your the impact uh, on subway creative and those types of campaigns? How do you like take what you've done, see it out there in the wild, and then kind of make informed decisions uh, based on that type of data? Yeah. Um, this is something also that's evolved over time, I'll say. Uh, we used to only, for, for any awareness channel, really prom promo codes was really the only way that we could measure directly the impact. Um, so, you know, if we got a couple hundred promo redemptions on a subway campaign, that would that would be a success, right? Um, we have since evolved and now we have a media mix model that is helping inform our, our media decisions, but also we have partnered with our out of home agency to get more data on our out of home. So, um, they work with a company called AdQuick and it doesn't, I don't think they have it for subways yet, but for any like billboards out on the, you know, on the highway, they can track using mobile ID tracking and we can see someone who has seen our billboard and do they come to our site and do they shop and do they place an order. So we have gotten smarter about our out of home advertising in particular um, using data like that. So that, that's that been really exciting to, to get more data about things that were a little bit uh, more nebulous in the past. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, I have a fun question here. Um, are you aware of the secret love or community around your Fresh Direct bags? Is that something that Fresh Direct is aware of? <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, um, you know, we, we had to stop taking our bags back during the pandemic. And, you know, our bags are, are awesome when you have five or ten of them. But when you have 50, uh, <laughs> people have to get annoyed. So um, we help develop a... a charity partnership where we have over a hundred organizations and new, I just got an email to while we're in this webinar of another organization that wants to sign up over a hundred organizations and all our geos that will take our backs back and use them for food donations, clothing, all kinds of services that they use. So yes, we know of the love of our bags and we, and we, it's really fun. We come out with a new bag every quarter. That's one of the highlights I think of, of the work that we do here. 
Yeah, I will say too, for, from a personal perspective, also, you know, I always I always get a kick out of, um, you know, especially because we have a tendency to feature a lot of our, um, you know, photography on the bags. You know, just kind of seeing it out there in the world. You know, something that was created, you know, on a very small scale uh, in our in our humble studio, kind of out there in the world um, at all times. I mean, it's really it's really heartening, and I, I get a kick out of it every time. So yeah, we also have kicked around the idea of doing some kind of social media campaign it's like show us where you brought your fresh dark bag because we've all seen like we've i think someone saw one in iceland like we've seen them all over the place so um oh. we know they're really great great bags that's awesome i love that um john i have a related question based on what you just said i'm just going to go back to here in case anyone wants to um uh get this qr code going while we chat but um John, um, I'm curious, and I'm sure others are curious, how have you added your personal or creative touch on um, the overall look of the imagery that we've seen throughout this presentation? Um, can you speak about like the brand identity and how that look comes together? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think, you know, I think it's kind of a collaboration between myself and, um, you know, everyone internally that's kind of involved. Um, and I think for the most part, you know, the brand, at least in terms of the overall brand look, I think a lot of that, um, we try and keep that relatively consistent, um, you know, at least in terms of like lighting styles and, you know, uh, angles and things like that. But, you know, I think for specific images, at least in terms of how they're styled and how they're put together, I mean, that's that's kind of like, it's largely informed by what it is that's being asked. Um, so typically, you know, depending upon how involved the person who's requesting the shot is um you know i might get a lot of inspo from you know uh existing images that come from other places or um you know somebody will have like a real solid um idea or concept for something that that presents itself uh automatically you know it kind of autom i can automatically associate a visual with that um other times it's a little bit more nebulous and i kind of have to work with them to draw out how something is is going to turn out uh in the, in the final image but Usually I like to kind of let, you know, the food and the items and everything like that determine how everything is going to is going to play out. Um, so at least in terms of how I style from shoot to shoot, that that largely um, is how it's determined, um, at least in, in terms of involving myself in it. I mean, especially to, you know, because of the scale at which we work, because it's usually either me or maybe like one or two other people that are working on a shoot. I mean, you know, it's kind of it's kind of difficult not to be inherently um, impressed upon whatever it is because, you know, because I'm just so, so intimately involved with it. So, you know, um, I think if, I think if you viewed everything kind of as a collection, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to not see a piece of me in, in all of it. So. Yeah. This, this question kind of uh, touches on what you just spoke about a little bit, but maybe you can, um, expand a little bit um what is like the request the photo request process look like for you so you've touched on this a bit in your workflow slide and just now even but um how do coworkers or stakeholders kind of request specific imagery from you uh is there like a, a mapping out of the visual like you just mentioned or a mood board or how do you source the right items and props uh to make it all come together yeah i mean you know frankly i would say it's largely um it's largely dependent upon who it's coming from, you know, um, because to give you to give you kind of a little bit of a um, high level sense uh, of the array of clients that I have internally. I mean, I'm probably, you know, regularly responsible for shooting for, I don't know, like 15, 20 different people. So, you know, everybody kind of comes at it with a different level of involvement, a different perspective, um, you know, a, a different kind of artistic eye or, you know, or maybe they just prefer to leave that up to me. So, um, so like I said, you know, I, I kind of have a tendency to take whatever I'm given, how much or how little, um, and then, you know, find a way to craft that into something that uh, is going to translate visually. Um, so like I said, sometimes, you know, I'll be provided a lot of visual inspiration. Um, there'll be kind of, you know, some descriptive language that'll color the way something is supposed to look and feel. Um, and sometimes it may just be as simple as a list of products. And, you know, I'm essentially um, left to my own devices to determine uh, how, to, how to present that. Sometimes, frankly, uh, from a creative perspective, those can be the best ones. Um, 
because you know it's it's not necessarily as prescriptive and so you know if if i get a particular amount of inspiration as to how i think something should look you know i i, I will be given a fair amount of um leeway to to make something out of that um so yeah i mean it you know it's 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 as varied as the number of people that <laughs> that I have to uh, to work with, um, but you know between me and them and kind of our collaboration throughout the process, um, you know we always land somewhere where everybody everybody is happy. So. Sure. Yeah, I was gonna say if you the ones that you have kind of creative freedom it must be fun to kind of just let your let your imagination shine and just kind of come up with a new look and feel. Well, you know, the interesting thing that I find too is like, um, especially in cases like that, you know, the people who are requesting them, like they they might kind of have like the seed of an idea of something that they thought might be possible with it. But then, you know, if you just kind of latch onto that and extrapolate it, when they actually see the final product, sometimes they're just, you know, they're even more enthusiastic about it because, you know, it's like, I think the fact that they they weren't necessarily so like prescriptive about the way that it was laid out, like it just gives them more opportunity to kind of, be surprised and be delighted by what comes out of it. So, you know, that's that's always um, pretty fulfilling when that happens. Yeah, that's fun. Um, I have questions about um, some some go-to tools or programs uh, you can't live without. And you spoke about this on your workflow slides a little bit, but I wanted to go to Katie first in the from a marketing and branding perspective, and then we can go back to photography perspective. Katie, do you have, and you, you probably touched on some of these, but do you have any tools or programs other than photo shelter that you cannot live without? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be a broken record, but it's Airtable for me. And there, there are similar tools that do what, what Airtable does. That was the one that worked best for us at the time. Um, but we really, it's really, really improves our efficiency, our trans, the transparency, our communication. Uh, and if this is any testament, we launched it February of 2020, basically. <laughs> and we were able to roll it out to about, I, th I think right now we probably have 60 people on there. Um, we rolled it out remotely. There were no complaints really. Everybody got, and I think, you know, we did a good job with the change management of, of moving to that system, but if I do say so myself, <laughs> but um, I think we really tried to bring everybody on board and let each team develop their own like mini world within the tool that worked for them, but then connect it. So I, I think taking the time to really think what the future was gonna look like uh, as we built it really made a difference. So we, we had a, a future, a long-term vision when we were building it versus we gotta get this done today, like just go do it wherever. Um, I think investing the time and thinking it through really, really made a difference. Yeah, awesome. And what about you, John? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, it's interesting. Like I was, I was thinking about this question a little bit um, previously and I mean, frankly, it's kind of difficult like to separate myself from almost any of the tools because, you know, especially to kind of accomplish what we do at speed right now. And again, you know, I kind of look retrospectively a little bit, um, you know, back to 2002 or even earlier um, when frankly, you know, probably none of these tools existed. Um, it's just, you know, it's hard to imagine being able to do what we do right now, um, again, at the speed and, you know, at the, Especially to um, you know to to point out photo shelter not not to be um, not to be left out but um, you know to be able to kind of disseminate things to so many various different sources and you know conglomerate things from various different sources just ways to organize things um, you know it's almost unfathomable how this could have been done before uh, everything was digital so you know the fact that we do have all of these digital tools to to perform all of these different um, functions of our our work um it's kind of indispensable by itself so totally yeah. i i totally think about that all the time too before there are a ton of things we could talk about before the digital age that are just mind-blowing to be honest um what are your this is kind of related to the tools that you use in your process but what are some of your and this can go to either one of you like recommended tips or go-to tips for kind of speeding up your process or making that kind of effortless and seamless uh, within your own team and organization? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I am a huge proponent of like group communication. So if it's Slack or Teams or whatever tool you're using, like the more open you can work, the faster it'll go. I, I like the bane of my existence is like 
50 different private conversations. I want to get like, the worst. I would much prefer, and it, you have to be vulnerable to do that. You're going to make mistakes or it might be messy as you, you work with the team to figure stuff out, but you'll get there so much faster and you get really good ideas out of it. Like we can't do everything in a meeting or in a conversation. This is a way to, to speed up the work. So I really, we used to have Slack. I really loved it. We translated a lot of that work to teams. Um, and I, I think that is a huge improvement. Awesome. What about you, John? Any, any tips for kind of making it more seamless? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, it, it's interesting, like, that was that was kind of uh, my initial thought, too, like, largely just about communication and um, and transparency and kind of, you know, in order to in order to get the job done more efficiently, you know, a lot of it is listening and kind of trying to figure out what it is that someone else needs, because, you know, sometimes, um, especially, too, like, if people kind of work in different worlds to a certain degree or they have different processes, it's like, you know, um, you can't always necessarily do a direct translation. So sometimes it's just a matter of sitting down and listening to to someone else to kind of figure out what it is from their perspective that they're trying to accomplish uh, and then translating for yourself how that's going to translate to your process as well. Because, you know, like I said, there's not always a direct correlation. And sometimes, you know, you can't always necessarily expect um, to explain what you do to someone else to such a degree that they're going to inherently understand it the same way that you do. So it's a it's kind of... It's always a bit of give and take there. And the other, the only the only addendum and caveat that I'll that I'll add to the um, communication part is, um, I guess sometimes too, it's a matter of being able to judge um, when when to be transparent and when to kind of just like own something and like you know you know like not necessarily covet it, but you know so, sometimes there are also times too you know when you kind of just have to um, you know when when being a little bit more um, you just have to you have to kind of take charge of the process a little bit more and you know so sometimes it's just being able to judge when to do that and when to kind of open things up a little bit more um so that's always a, a, a bit of a balancing act as well nice i love that it goes into um what, what i want to do uh or ask is my last question because we've reached the hour here um i wanted to ask katie specifically but we can go to we can go to both of you too um over the course of your career, what's one tip uh, that you've learned that you can share with uh, the people watching, and whether yeah. it's in marketing and branding or photography or any of that? I actually have two, if that's okay. But um, and and it's more related to branding. And these are obvious. Like anyone who works in marketing should know this, but be surprised how many times we have to repeat this or remind everybody. Um, consistency is key. You know, in the past we were asked to come up with new campaigns every more than once a year, I'll say, and like, and I think it's, it was out of boredom, like people see the same photo internally, we're seeing the same photo, and so we think, oh, everyone's seen that, no one's paying attention out in the world, like, we'd be lucky if somebody remembered that we used that soup photo twice, right, and so big, the, the, the icons out there, they don't change their tagline every three months, <laughs> you know, I'm loving it, it's been around for 10 years, just right. do it, it's been here forever, like, we, we consistency and reminding people who you are and what you stand for is super important. So that's something we're really leaning into. And I'm really excited to do that. Um, and then the other thing for marketing in general is it, it's been here. We've been really logistically focused in the past, um, again, because it is so important to protect the quality of the food and, you know, deliver for our customers. But uh, that sometimes meant that our marketing was very ROI, you know, driven. So we would, invest the most in the channels where we could see an immediate impact uh that we could see that promo code redemption and know that that drove this many orders but you need the awareness out in the market you can't do that without awareness the awareness lifts all the boats right so i always say it's not one channel it's all the channels you got to figure out how they play together and what role they, they play with each other um and you can't just put all your eggs in one of one one marketing channel so that's something that i think we've gotten a lot better um, with over the years and something I would remind everybody in terms of marketing. Awesome. I love those tips. How about you, John? Any, any advice you've learned or lessons you've learned over the course of your career as a, as a photographer? Yeah. I mean, I'd say generally, you know, um, kind of not to be afraid to do things that, um, you know, seem uncomfortable or that, you know, you might not 
necessarily feel like you have you fully have a grasp of because I think you know over time it's taking on those challenges that might seem a little bit outside of your wheelhouse that really you know um, help build your repertoire and uh, really help build your confidence in what you are able to accomplish um, and then beyond that generally like just as a matter of career advice um, especially when you're working with people very closely like it's not worth being mean to anyone for any reason like just don't do it <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, because because of the old adage that you never know, you know, who might be your boss someday or something like that. But also, um, like, just why? Like, what's the point? Life is too short. Right. Just just be nice. <laughs> you never know what someone's going through either. They they it's true. Yep. Mean comment yep. on a bad day is, is never fun. So yep. that's great advice. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you both so much for joining, taking the time today. It's been uh, very special. Um, you know, we've we've done this with Fresh Direct once or twice before. We've learned from them, but um, adding Katie to the mix and learning a little bit about your history has been really fun and special. So I'm really appreciative of you both. Um, I just wanted to say thank you one more time. And for everyone watching, thank you guys. Um, anything else before we go to the two of you? No, this was great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. guys. Appreciate the effort.